Hey, I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to message number five in this series about drawing near to God. Love this series. I love the content in this series. I'm already getting great testimonies for this series. And so I just appreciate so very, very much that you are uh, a part of this and that you're walking and making this journey with me. So, you know, we, we've talked about this some, and I, I have to review this a little bit every week because there's always new people jumping in every week. And this is such crucial information. You know, there are so many things that religion has taught us. Now, remember that there's a difference between religion and faith. Faith is where we believe what God said about having a relationship with him and how to have a relationship with him. Therefore, we approach him on his term. Religion is where we don't believe what God says, so we come up with our own terms that make sense to us. So religion approaches God on our terms. Faith, which is just trust, that's really all that is, faith approaches God on his terms. And so in the Old Testament, you had these sacrifices that were made, and these they were called feasts, they were called festivals, there were, there were a lot of different terminology is used to describe them. But um, we have been taught by religion that all of these feasts uh, were where you would come and you would bring your offering to God and you would make a sacrifice, you would appeal to God, and basically, you are trying to get God to come to you. You're trying to get God to respond to you. So really what you're doing is you're buying his uh, a response, his allegiance through this offering that you bring. And, you know, that's that concept was, uh, even though it wasn't scriptural, you know, that's not ever what God said. Matter of fact, you know, God said just the opposite of that, you know. Uh, there are so many scriptures that just rebuke the Israelites for thinking that basically they could buy favor with God through their sacrifices. You know, one of my favorite ones, and you, you know, used to hear this by these people that preach an exaggerated prosperity message. Now, I believe in prosperity. I just don't believe in the name it, claim it, grab it, and stab it version of prosperity. I believe that prosperity is something that we should experience so that we can help the poor, so that we can uh, so that we can reach the world, so that we can minister to people's needs. I mean, so, so that we can use it to express the love of God to a hurting and needy world. It's not just about having a lot of stuff. It's not, it's not, there's nothing wrong, though, with being prosperous unless you put your trust and your hope in prosperity or, or in wealth. And Jesus was actually very, very clear about that. But uh, uh, one of the scriptures that people used to love to express wrongly in the prosperity movement was that uh, that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. And so the whole idea was, since God owns all these cattle on a thousand hills, then you can eat steak every day because God owns them, God to got to kill them for you, and da 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 Well, that, if you actually read that scripture in context, not only is that uh, not what the scripture is talking about, but that's an insult to what it is talking about. Because in that scripture, basically God says, look, you're bringing me these sacrifices as if I need them, as if I want them. And he says, if I was hungry, I would kill something and eat it myself, because after all, the cattle on a thousand hills, they all belong to me. And so the idea here is God doesn't need anything from us. The, all of the sacrifices that were brought to God were actually brought to God because of the influence that those sacrifices would have on our heart. And so um, we, we know based on the Hebrew words, and we know this based on really uh, scientific research uh, that presents a accurate uh, concept of the psychology of man. Here's what we know. We know that when people give a gift to anyone, to God, to the devil, to another person. And people give a gift to anyone that, in fact, one of the things that happens is by the giving of a gift, you are placing value uh, on that person. And uh, so, so when we bring a gift, or you might even say a sacrifice, I don't like that terminology. I don't know that, I don't know that's the best biblical terminology. 
But when we bring a sacrifice to God, then the real truth is we are expressing a value toward God. Now, if you just do it begrudgingly, man, that works against you uh, because you because you get cheap, you get bitter, you get stingy, and then you get this idea that God is obligated to you because you have made a sacrifice to him. Well, now, that is the entire basis of paganism. All paganism is 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 brought on the basis that that those gods are angry all the time, and if you will bring him a sacrifice, uh, that you might appease his wrath. And and so uh, that paganistic concept has been brought into Judaism, and then ultimately brought into uh, Christianity. Uh, Catholicism pretty much cemented that as as a primary doctrine for giving gifts and and offerings and sacrifices to the Lord. And so, uh, but that is, that is not it at all. God promised that he would always be there. God promised that he'd never leave us. He'd never fail us. He would never forsake us. God promised that that when when we needed him, uh, that if if we would draw near to him, he would and could draw near to us. Now, let me just say this. One of the most uh, unbelieved factors about God is that God never forces anything on anyone. There's no place in the Bible. I mean, if you take some of the bad translations and that sort of thing, yes, you can come up with this idea that God forces people into things. But the real truth is God doesn't force us into anything. God calls us. He woos us. He teaches us. He gives us his word. He has the Holy Spirit ministering to our heart. He is doing all of these things to inspire us to follow him, inspire us to trust him. But the real truth is he never makes us do anything. God is not in control of you. You need to understand that. He is always working to accomplish his will in your life, but it is always your choice as to whether you, you do or not. Now, it's really interesting because, because, again, we're talking about drawing near to God. If Jesus is the model that we have of God, if Jesus is the place that we look and we say, oh, okay, this is the one place that I can understand God is by looking at Jesus. And Jesus came and he laid down his life for us. He became our sin. He paid the price for our sin. And uh, he met all of the legal requirements for our the debt of our sin being paid. Now, this is not about uh, satisfying the wrath of God. This is about fulfilling the righteousness of God, and and we'll go we'll go into that somewhere here. We we don't have time to go into all that right now. But uh, the sacrifice of Jesus, while it did satisfy all the requirements uh, for the wrath of God against all sin to be settled for that debt to be paid so the wrath was the wrath was really a debt that was owed for that sin and so that debt was paid and because it was paid then the real truth is we should have no fear in approaching god and it's amazing that religion tries to convince you that fear is the one reason you should approach god be afraid of god be afraid he's going to kill you be afraid he's going to hurt you i got news for you um, faith works by love, and faith is trust more than it is anything else. And so the real truth is you can never trust anyone that you are afraid of. And it's so essential that you realize that the reason the world hates God is because they're afraid of God, because religion has lied to them about God for 6,000 years and has convinced the human race that God is angry, that God is full of wrath, and that God is going to get even with you, and the one hope that you have that he's not going to pour his wrath out on you is if you'll come to Jesus. Now, he's going to make you feel like a dog. He's going to you know, he's going to browbeat you the rest of your life. He's going to make you feel bad about who you are. But at the end of the day, you'll get to heaven, even though God wants to puke every time he looks at you. That's kind of, that's really kind of the way religion, you know, presents this thing. But the real truth is, we enter into eternal life. We go to heaven because we are righteous. We have been made righteous through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the blood of Jesus, the Bible says, is a propitiation. So you know that in a propitiation, you know 
that wrath is appeased. It is completely satisfied. But but the greater thing about propitiation or the positive side of propitiation is that is that a propitiation of the blood being shed actually satisfies the requirements for righteousness. And you know, in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew letters that are used for every Hebrew word. Uh, there's what's called a light side and dark side. And so negative people tend to only look at the dark side of interpreting Hebrew words and Hebrew letters. And um, it doesn't have to be that way. Now, you, if you violate God's word, you do have to understand the, the dark side of it. But if you trust God, then you recognize the, the light side of it, the life side of it. And so we understand that whenever, whenever uh, we accept what the blood of Jesus has done for us, we understand that the light side, the life side of that is, in fact, that the righteous requirements of the law, according to Romans 10, for all of the righteous requirements of the law have been satisfied. So we are able to be declared righteous. Well, the fact that we are declared righteous means that we are automatically delivered from wrath. So we have no reason to be afraid of God hurting us or God doing anything to us, but religion will make you afraid of God. And, uh, you know, religion tries to convince you, it tries to convince the world that if, uh, you'll, if you're afraid of God, you'll live right. No, you won't. If you're afraid of God, you'll just lie about how you live. If you're afraid of God, you'll cover up how you live. If you're afraid of God, you'll blame everybody else for your shortcomings. If you're afraid of God, then the real truth is you will never have a trusting, loving relationship. So I mean, that means that you will never walk in faith with him. And the real truth is it is impossible to please God apart from faith, because if faith is not there, and you're doing something out of fear, then the real truth is uh, you, you don't trust him. And so without faith, it's impossible to please God at all, because that means you're doing it for some other reason. And, and it means you don't trust him. You think he's a liar. You think he is a murderer. You think he is a wrathful God, just like all of the pagan gods. You know, so 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 many people, you know, Romans, by the way, Romans 2, 4, Paul challenged a group of these Romans who just were not willing to understand the value of the goodness and the patience and the long suffering of God. And so uh, they despised it. And as such, they, they perverted the gospel. They perverted the whole concept of sin. They perverted the whole understanding of righteousness. They perverted the whole understanding of wrath. And so, so he says, the problem is, is, is you, you despise the riches of the goodness, the forbe forbearance, the, and the patience of God, because you don't seem to understand that it is the goodness of God that brings us to a place of repentance. Well, what is repentance? Repentance is, you know, you, you may have some emotions over the horrible things that you have done. I've had some horrible emotions, and, and, and the truth is, if you, if you never if you never feel bad about the things that you've done, something's wrong with you. you. You got what the Bible calls a hard heart. I guarantee you this, when God gives you a new heart, you will feel bad about the wicked things that you've done, the things that have hurt people, the things that have, that have destroyed other people's lives. I'll tell you the gr greatest uh, uh, guilt I have had uh, in, in my entire life. And I, I knew I was forgiven for it. I didn't will labor under it. But the greatest guilt and shame that I have ever had was the things that I did that hurt other people uh, before I got saved. And really uh, looking back at my life after I got saved, many times when I was selfish, self-centered, many times when I was holding back goodness or kindness, or many times when I was being uh, vengeful or angry, and I realized now what damage I did to other people. I got news for you. When you hurt other people, if you do not feel bad about it, you have what the Bible calls a hard heart. Now, ain't no sense in beating yourself up uh, over it. You just come to God, get your heart healed. But, you know, it's, it's really an interesting thing because religion has always used fear uh, as the primary motivator to get people to live right. Well, according to the Bible, fear doesn't make you live right. 
in fact, uh, goodness will bring you to a place of repentance because it will make you value uh, the patience, the goodness, the kindness, the long suffering uh, of God. So, so you start realizing, well, wait a minute. So the thing that all of my life was used to try to get me to follow God, to serve God, is actually the, the primary thing that the Bible says will turn me against God. It was a really, really interesting um, uh, story uh, where someone came to Jesus, Mark 9, 20. It says, it says so th there was this man and his, his son basically had a spirit and he needed deliverance. And so he said that uh, when, when, the son, when the son saw Jesus, that, he, that immediately the spirit convulsed him. He fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at the mouth. And so uh, this is so interesting. Jesus just turned to the father and started asking him some questions. How long has this been happening to him? And uh, he said, well, since his childhood, I know the father's sitting there thinking, uh, we don't need to be talking about this. I just, I just want you to help him. But anyhow, so he says, well, since childhood, and verse 22, he says, he, he's often thrown him into the fire and into the water of trying to destroy him. He said, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help him. Now, this is so phenomenal because, you see, we put all of the responsibility on Jesus for solving the problem uh, as a means to really relieve us of our responsibility. See, religion says, believe for magic. Believe that you can just do, make a big sacrifice. You can do something. You can have a big enough faith. You can do all this kind of stuff or whatever. And they, and they turn faith into something that's really perverted. And they turn faith into kind of an emotional payment that you're making toward God. And so basically they're saying, he said, the father's saying, look, just do, do what you can. You know, th this has been happening to him. And if you can do anything, you know, I was a substance, substance abuse counselor for a lot of years. And one of the things that we learn in substance abuse counseling, and that is every time you're doing an intake on a new patient, I had a clinic where we treated substance uh, uh, abuse. Every time you're doing an intake on a new patient, one of the things you have to be aware of is in that very first session, they're sizing you up and they're trying to figure out a way to make you responsible for them getting clean. And if they can make you responsible, and if you're full of yourself enough where you brag about your program, you talk about what your program will do this, your program will do that, da 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 da, da then basically you put all responsibility onto your program, onto your counseling, how smart you are, how many degrees you've got, all that kind of stuff. And so basically, you assume all the responsibility for this person getting off drugs. Well, so it's, it's so really interesting. So the man said to Jesus, look, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us, implying that if we don't get the help we need, it's your fault and you are not actually compassionate. And so Jesus said to him, no. The question is not if I can do anything. The question is, what can you do? And what you need to do is you need to believe that all things are possible to him who believes. And if you don't believe, if you do not believe, now what, what does the Bible say about faith? The Bible says in the book of faith, I mean, book of Hebrews 11 chapter, is it, it says that faith believes that God is. Now, that's not just saying that God exists. It's believing that he is who he says he is. That he that that he is the great I am. He he is who he was. He is who he is. He will forever be who he was. Who he is. He never changes. And this is why you know, when Jesus made the made this statement where he says, you know, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was getting that right out of the book of Exodus. Everything that Jesus said about himself, he was quoting an Old Testament scripture. So that means all these people that that poo poo the Old Testament and act like it's no good. It just, it just really means their heart is hard and they don't understand the Bible because the real truth is everything's in the New Testament came and has its roots and its basis in the, the Old Testament. So anyhow, the, you know, all the people come running because they see that Jesus is going to do something. They want to see a miracle. They don't care about the guy getting help. They just want to see a miracle. They go running up there together. And so Jesus rebukes this unclean spirit and tells it, tells it to come out. 
and it's a deaf and dumb spirit and and so the spirit comes out of him uh and and he is and he is set free and so the amazing thing about this is Jesus asked him a very very crucial question and the crucial question was do you believe and the man said yes I believe, but help my unbelief. Now, listen, we live in what I call the era of the fake grace movement, fake faith movement. And I'm not saying there's no truth in some of those movements because, man, I believe in the grace of God. I believe in faith. I believe in living by faith. But people have tried so hard uh, to teach these things uh, in ways that are really not scripturally consistent, that that they've exaggerated them and they've twisted, you know, what they what they really really mean. And so, one of the things that that kind of emerged out of the faith movement is that you never admit uh, that you that you don't believe. You never do that. That's just that's a cardinal sin to admit that you that you don't believe something. Well, the problem is you cannot conquer anything that you don't own. You know, the word confess, it's kind of interest, an interesting word. And the Bible talks about confessing sin. But I'm telling you, people lose their mind when you start confessing sin. On the one hand, you've got religious people who who make it all about beating yourself up, feeling, your, feeling full of shame, all that kind of stuff. And uh, you got that group of people. And then on the other hand, you've got the people who say, you never, never, ne we don't have to confess. We're in Jesus. He's already paid for our sin. Well, both of those groups of people, they're extremists in different directions, and both of them have gone into such uh, extremes in their work theology that they cause us to miss one of the most powerful things about getting set free. The word confess means to take hold of something like taking hold of a rock. Now, the idea is, and the greatest example that I have of this would be if you are walking down a road and you get a rock in your shoe. Now, you can deny that the rock is there, and it's going to stay there. You can uh, uh, you, you can pretend like it doesn't hurt, and you're going to get home, and your foot's going to be messed up. You're going to probably get an infection in your foot, might lose your foot, who knows? But the point is, if you can't take hold of that rock, if you can't pick it up, then you can't throw it away. So if you've got a rock in your shoe, confessing it, is like actually sticking your hand out in your shoe, getting a hold of the rock so that you can throw it away. So the point of it is, if you do not confess your sin, you cannot throw it away. You cannot overcome anything that you won't own. And so the idea here is not that you confess it, you hold on to it, you wallow in it, you beat yourself up. No, you have to own it in your own heart, and your own mind, you have to own it uh, so that you can take hold of it and so that you can surrender that to the Lord Jesus. So the guy says, yes, I believe, but help my unbelief. You know, that, that's, that's sort of like, uh, you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, but I'm trying to trust you. Uh, you know, I, I know I deserve what I've got, but I really want to get out of this situation. I need a pass for, you know, I need a pass for, for what you're going to do. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's like, man, I'm, I'm sort of there. I, I'm, I, I sort of believe, but I don't really fully believe. Well, the idea here is that only God himself working in your heart by the Holy Spirit can bring you to that place of drawing near to him. And it's not just because of theological correctness per se, it's about drawing near to him as your high priest, the person who has paid for your sins, the person who has made it possible for all the promises of God to be yours and set you free from these limiting beliefs, from these limiting situations that are destroying your life. It's kind of interesting. I got to wrap up on this. I, we might get into this some next week. When you look in the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter, it gives us kind of a list of these unbearable sins for which people will find themselves totally alienated from God. And the two top things at the top of that list in Revelation 21 is fear and unbelief. 
You say, well, wait a minute. That list has got, uh, you know, abominations, murder, sexual immora uh, immorality, sorcery, idolatry, liars, you know, all of this stuff. So why are fear and unbelief in here with all these wicked, 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 wicked sins? Well, I'll tell you, because all of those wicked sins emerge from fear and unbelief. Fear always leads to unbelief. And unbelief is the statement that we don't trust God. We consider him to be a liar. Listen, I got, I got news for you. You can own what you got. And the first step that you have got to take if, if you're going to move yourself into getting free, getting the rock out of your shoe, whatever it is, whether, it's, whether you need physical healing, whether you need to get out of financial desperations, whether you need to get out of a sin problem, no matter what it is, you got to be able to get a hold of the rock. You got to own it. You have got to take hold of this. And really, when you take hold of this and throw this away, this removes that Jesus has already paid for this. Jesus has already done everything that you need to do to be able to draw near to him and experience, experience his forgiveness. So if his forgiveness is given. The problem is we can't experience it. You can't experience the healing as long as you got the rock in your shoe because the pain is ever present, even though legally and technically has been paid for. Listen. You be sure and share this with some of your friends. I'll be sharing some more about this kind of stuff every week. And if you're interested in drawing near to God and, and experiencing God's life, God's healing, God's blessing, you be sure and keep listening to this. And, and let me encourage this. If you want to help us take this gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth, I'll invite you to go to impactministries.com. I want you to look at uh, the World Changer Program. I want you to consider becoming a part of that World Changer Program helping us reach the entire world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We don't have much time left, if you want to know the truth, to reach the world. And I'm going to be doing every single thing I can. We are starting Bible schools all over the world. And it is our goal, it is our intention. Everything that we're doing is to raise up one billion disciples, committed followers of Jesus, who are following Jesus by believing the truth in their hearts. So be sure and check it out. Got a great series. Uh, that, that I'll be glad to share with you uh, as you become a world changer with us. It'll just be a, a free gift that we'll give you. And uh, got all kinds of series that we can make available to you. As a matter of fact, we got over 200 free series on our website. So be sure and check it out. I will be talking to you again next week.